written as Gagandhi. Gaga- Meshram, change your name. Your name is also become Gagandhi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, why, what is this? Oh, yes, because I know you. But um, I confess. Uh, yeah, now, now he, he was trying to, uh, you know, uh, masquerade as uh, Gagandhi, but he could not. <laughs> why? <laughs> yeah. I, I need to teach him how to tie a turban, actually. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. And then, then I, yeah, do you, who is this? Gagandhi. Gagandhi. Ah, I'm Gagandhi. Gagandhi. Yeah. Okay. But this is very enjoyable. Um, oh, okay. I've lost it. <laughs> okay. We, yeah. Okay. So. We will enjoy it. Okay. Now, um, I have to. Uh, share my screen uh, but before me maybe uh, so the flow usually is uh, that uh, dr meshram uh, comes on he uh, talks about the entire program and then he introduces the chairperson which will okay. be dr. garcia and dr garcia will come in and uh, he will introduce <laughs> That is usually our flow. So I think uh, I think that is how we will go in case there is a change. Doctor Meshram could answer. Okay. No, it remains the same. Yeah, very much the same. Hmm. I'm back. Can you hear me from this one also? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Um. So, <laughs> so how is your COVID issue? Everything is okay or getting worse or bad, better? So there are some cities in which it is uh, now decreasing, but uh, in other cities it is increasing. So just like the US, mm-hmm. um, it's uh, in cities like Bombay and Delhi, it has come down. Am okay. I right? How is it in Pune and uh, Nagpur? And uh, the place where I am, it is still to peak. So we expect that it is going, it's getting from bad to worse. So Pune we expect still, it. Still high among mm. the top. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of yes, peaks and then, then comes down, I think so. It's, it's uh, the same story everywhere, actually. Yeah, yeah. How is yeah. it in Turkey? In Turkey, actually, we have seen a little bit decrease uh, before mm. several weeks, mm. but uh, these uh, during the last week, there is an increase, unfortunately. Uh, but the school is a very important issue, so uh, mm. it's postponed uh, to opening the school, even universities, even medical students. And I'm not so sure that are these um, are these uh, good uh, options uh, to manage the uh, pandemic actually because education is very important, economy is very important, life saving is naturally very important, but must be something different to manage all these uh, very uh, important three main area of the population. I don't know how we can do, how we can do work, I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, it's the same story everywhere actually. Mm-hmm. Mm. Ah, Professor, Shakir, Professor. Hello, here at Noor. Okay. How are Hi. You? <laughs> fine, thank you. And you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hello, uh, everyone. I'm, I'm happy to hear you here. <laughs> nice to hear you. Nice to <laughs> see you. Thank okay. you for working on, on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I, I thank you. I thank for for these all continuous, very valuable efforts. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Professor Shakir. Greetings from Sri Lanka. 
Hello, nice to see you. Hi, greetings, greetings. Chandra Shekhar, how are you? This is going very well now. It's the fifth week or the fourth? Fifth, fifth, fifth. Is it week this number five? The fifth week, yeah. Fifth week. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is the fifth. Hello, Bagandeep, how um, are you? <laughs> very well, very well. How, how are things in London? In London, it's um, miserable, wet, and not nice. Rain. <laughs> <laughs> rain today. Right? We have we right? have heat wave, we heat wave two three days, and now the rain is coming. Mm. It's good for the right. garden. But maybe it is good for COVID. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. So yes. they so the rain can uh, limit to go out or <laughs> something. We wait. We wait. Yes. Thank you. Mm. So. Do we start now? Are you there? Okay. Yes, Do I am. Start? Hi. 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 Yeah. How are hey, you? Nice to see you. Nice. Me too. Thank you. Great time. In Austria. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, Dr. Meshram, do we start? Uh, Dr. Singhal is yet to join, no? Was Dr. Meshram very quiet today? <laughs> Why? He, he must be <laughs> tired because of webinars. <laughs> no. <laughs> so many webinars. <laughs> I wonder if he's muted. Right. Okay. Uh, Dr. Meshram, can you unmute yourself and should we start? I think he's on the phone. Dr. Dadendi, please, he's on call, I think. Maybe. Okay. Uh, Mansi, are we ready? Have, we, have you? Are you broadcasting it across? Mansi, are you there? Hello. Dr. Meshram, you need to unmute, we can't hear you. Hello? Hello, hello? Gagandeep uh, sir, I'll, I'll talk to Mansi in a second. Uh, this is Sripad. Talk to him. Yeah, it's... Yeah, it's... Yeah, it's... Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sorry. Uh, Dr. Gagandeep? Yes. Uh, she's already shared the screen. We have 126 participants. We can start at the end now. Once uh, Dr. Right. Mehta, can you figure the beginning? Right. Okay. Uh, uh, welcome again. This is the six, fifth in the series of neuroinfections, the WFN fine. Uh, neuroinfection series. Uh, warm welcome to everyone, especially our uh, guest speaker, Professor Serefnor Ortsuk from Turkey. She's uh, uh, and the chairpersons. I wonder if uh, Professor Singal has joined, but uh, Dr. David Garcia from Spain. 
Uh, he's the chairperson of the international section of the Spanish Society for Neurology. Um, I see Professor Singel is also here, and yes, uh, both the I'm chairpersons. So um, yes. Warm welcome to Professor, uh, the WFN past president, Professor uh, 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 to Dr. Wolfen Grisold and Professor Raj Shakir. Um, so I'll pass on the mic to Dr. Meshram, who would introduce the chairpersons. The chairpersons would in turn introduce the speaker, the main speaker, as well as the three uh, discussants, three people who would discuss the three cases and, and uh, go on with the proceedings. So Dr. Meshram, please uh, take on from here onwards and uh, kindly introduce the chairperson. Dr. Meshram, uh, are you hearing? Uh, hello? Yeah. Hello? Uh, there is a problem uh, at, at your end. I think, are you... Hello, Dr. Meshram. I think you will have to leave and then log in again. Should we in the meantime start? It's, uh, I think he's having a problem in, uh, he cannot get across. Gavan is uh, not really necessary for him to introduce me, you know, I think yes, uh, the best yes, thing is that, uh, so the best I thing would be that, uh, yeah, I think yes, uh, just put the bio data of uh, our main speaker, Professor Sarandu, yes, yes. and I can introduce so, her. Yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Garcia, you have the slide for uh, introducing uh, Dr. Orstruk. Sure. Dr. Garcia, please. I will share my screen with you. Right. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to introduce the chairpersons, Professor Singel. Everyone knows Dr. Singel uh, extremely well. And Dr. Garcia is from the Spanish uh, Society for Neurology. He is going to introduce the main speaker, and then we would proceed ahead. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure to join you in these wonderful sessions. We are all facing a, a hard time against the coronavirus, but uh, we have uh, this uh, little break to learn a bit about other neuroinfections that are indeed very important. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Serefnur Osturk. Serefnur Osturk, please forgive me if my pronunciation is not the, the optimal, uh, started her training in Ankara then uh, she did a, a, an internship and neurology residency, which was indeed uh, certified by the Turkish Neurological Board Council Certificate. And her experience in, in various European and worldwide societies, uh, it's really amazing. She has been involved in many panels and task forces, including uh, stroke positions, rare diseases, coma, and uh, because of that, probably, and because of her excellent work as a researcher and a teacher, he became a president of the Turkish uh, Neurology Society of Neurology. She has been also involved in the World Foundation of Neurology. She is the representative of uh, Turkey. And, and uh, as you can see, she has been author of uh, more than 150 national and international publications. She has been, uh, uh, she has, she's member of uh, many scientific committees and she has been involved in the organization of uh, uh, numerous international meetings. And she is also involved in the editorial and reviewer uh, for many journals. So please, Professor Osturk, uh, it's our pleasure to learn from you. 
Thank you. Uh, Dr. Singhal, sir, would you like to say a few words? May I start? I think that Professor Singhal is speaking, but uh, his microphone is mute. Mm. Please, uh, you know, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a great pleasure, madam, you know, to listen to you. That was a very important topic during this COVID era of the encephalitis. Many of the viruses can cause it, and we have the also immune encephalitis, but we're very eager to listen to you, uh, especially during this area, during this uh, period of the COVID virus. Please, Professor Ostro, please start. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, for this wonderful uh, organization and uh, for the invitation uh, to WDFN and Prime Neuroinfection Webinar uh, Series Committee. And uh, Dr. Mishram especially, uh, he is doing uh, very hard and very great work uh, effort to continue these uh, webinars are really very important for all, uh, all, uh, all of the world, for young neurologists especially. And uh, I'm proud of uh, to be a part of this uh, great effort. Uh, encephalitis uh, is today's main uh, subject and is uh, it's really very, very large and um, uh, it, it is important to, in, uh, to be included uh, within this webinar series uh, by WFN and FINE, uh, you can see on the screen. And I'm sure that I believe that uh, it will be uh, followed by uh, a lot of young neurologists and also maybe infectious disease uh, specialists because uh, this is really very uh, challenging area. We have uh, to know a lot of uh, items, a lot of subject information uh, for the uh, encephalitis as a multidisciplinary team, especially. And the definition, prevalence, etiology, pathogenesis, diagnosis and treatment uh, are uh, very important. Uh, even uh, in uh, there is a lot of differences in definition. Uh, as a uh, common definition, we can say that encephalitis is an important cause of morbidity, mortality, and permanent neurological disability in both adults and children. Uh, the term encephalitis literally means inflammation of part of all, all of the encephalon and brain parenchyma. And uh, uh, we have a lot of difficulties actually as neurologists and uh, more than us, uh, patients with encephalitis, encephalitis uh, have a lot of difficulty because uh, there are uh, uh, a, an important delay uh, during the diagnosis and there are a lot of um, lack of information and equipment uh, and uh, uh, tools to make diagnosis uh, by uh, infectious disease specialists and also neurologists. And um, this is important. Uh, actually, this is an urgent uh, matter, urgent subject as stroke, uh, because the treatment must be uh, initiated as early as possible. Otherwise, uh, the patient can have uh, very important disabilities. Uh, for this reason, uh, we must make uh, more efforts to increase uh, awareness, uh, especially for early diagnosis and early uh, treatment. Uh, Sometimes, uh, even uh, among neurologists, encephalitis and meningitis are overlapping syndrome. Uh, actually, 
pathologically both viral and non-viral invasion of the uh, of the brain actually uh, can combine um, uh, meningeal and parenchymal inflammation together. And in, uh, for this uh, condition, as, uh, generally we are using meningoencephalitis term. Clinically, there is a spectrum of manifestation, but by and large, two distinct patterns uh, are seen actually. And uh, if there is a more consciousness problem and mental status uh, alteration changes, uh, we are using uh, encephalitis, but uh, otherwise, if there is meningeal irritation is prominent, so we prefer uh, meningitis. Sometimes uh, it can be together, then uh, we can use uh, meningoencephalitis. Uh, and uh, for this uh, acute and urgent, actually, syndrome, uh, World Health Organization uh, used uh, acute encephalitis syndrome uh, for the purpose of surveillance, actually. But uh, these terms uh, was used uh, as a, a common um, uh, term uh, covering uh, all encephalitis syndrome uh, dependent on a viral or bacterial or other causes. And we have uh, some definition. Uh, we need major criterion. Uh, patient presenting to medical attention with altered mental status defined as decreased or altered level of consciousness or lethargy or person personality change. And it must be uh, more than 24 hours. And we need minor criteria, uh, two, at least two for possible uh, encephalitis and more than three for probable or confirmed encephalitis. These are documented favor uh, and um, the more than uh, 38 degree. And uh, it must be within uh, 72 hours before or after presentation. Generalized or par partial seizures uh, but uh, it must not uh, to be dependent uh, previous uh, seizure disorder. Uh, it's uh, newly onset. New onset of focal neurological findings. Uh, it's important uh, symptom actually. CSF white blood count. It must be more than five per uh, millimeter cube. Abnormality of brain parenchyma on, on neuroimaging. And it must be subject the suggestive of encephalitis, not stroke, not in other, uh, any other uh, pathology. And abnormality on electroencephalography that is consistent with encephalitis, it is important uh, contributing uh, item. And most important, uh, we must exclude uh, of encephalopathy caused by trauma, metabolic disturbance, tumor, alcohol abuse, sepsis, or other non-infectious causes. And uh, definite cases, this, this is really difficult to make definite diagnosis, and it requires pathologic confirmation on brain biopsy, evidence of infection with a microorganism associated with encephalitis or laboratory evidence of an autoimmune condition associated with encephalitis. Uh, epidemiology is important because uh, we need to know amount of uh, uh, prevalence and also incidence of the disease to make uh, preparation for uh, prevention for treatment uh, to establish uh, care uh, units and even um, uh, manpower. And I would like to thank again, Professor uh, Rad Shakir for this very important study. And uh, we have some data uh, with this uh, atlas, uh, with this study. 
encephalitis, you know, you, see, you can see uh, not so rare actually, it's 10th rank and uh, it's really uh, very important for uh, especially um, lower economical situation uh, to the countries. And you can see uh, important uh, daily loss. You can see pink as encephalitis and also that uh, lost uh, years of, of uh, because of that. Uh, so uh, encephalitis is uh, important and very common um, uh, pathology disease. Uh, even more common than Parkinson disease or uh, multiple sclerosis. And you can compare the facilities and conditions and financial supports for these uh, diseases. Encephalitis uh, is, uh, is not uh, so supported. Uh, by financial or by a research project, uh, and um, it's, um, uh, it's a, I can say that it's a neglected area actually, because uh, there is a multidisciplinary uh, approach, and sometimes uh, patients, even in clinical practice, uh, I'm sure you experience experienced uh, with this condition. Sometimes infectious disease specialists offer the patient you for, to care. Sometimes uh, you, you can, uh, if you have not available opportunity, uh, you can ask uh, infectious uh, disease uh, specialist uh, for help. For this reason, uh, we have to know the exact, the proper, uh, epidemiological data related to uh, encephalitis. Worldwide prevalence varies actually, uh, but um, uh, there are some uh, large studies uh, and they showed uh, us that 16% uh, of patients had confirmed or probable etiological agent identified. This, uh, this is also a problem we have a lot of uh, patients who has not determined etiology. And um, of the determined cases, 69% uh, were viral, the most part of viral, 20% bacterial, 7% uh, prion, and 3% parasitic, and 1% fungi and also 13% possible etiologies uh, and other etiologies. And also autoimmune etiology uh, was important, 8%. And uh, I believe that this is more common, but we don't uh, find, actually we don't recognize the, uh, this common uh, syndrome. Uh, and the remaining 63% had no etiology identified. This, this is unbelievable for uh, 21 century, actually. Yeah. And uh, per uh, 100 person per year, we have uh, 4.3 cases and the median age, uh, young actually, uh, for three years, and uh, more, uh, more of them were female. Yeah, and the median length of stay, uh, not too much, actually four days. Uh, this is uh, longest for fun fungal uh, infection, arboviral or bacterial meningitis. And mortality, uh, overall mortality uh, was 2.3, approximately 2.9, approximately 3%, not uh, so low. And it is uh, higher uh, in those with bacterial, uh, eight, approximately 8%. This is very high rate, actually, for fungal also same and arboviral. And readmission rate is also 
uh, very high. And it can mean that we don't uh, treat these patients appropriately. Yeah, yes. And uh, empirical anti antibiotics, antivirals, and antifungal were administered, uh, most of them, 85% uh, uh, antiviral and antibacterial, um, approximately 53, and um, antifungal, 7.8. 7, uh, this is depends on etiology. And we have also another uh, patient group that uh, we are trying to treat them, but why trying to uh, treat them? We harm them. <laughs> uh, this is also very challenging issue. Uh, for example, um, for immune compromised person, uh, we have some risk, where say Lazostar virus, Domegalovirus, herpes virus, a lot of kind of uh, micro, uh, microorganism can harm. And also another uh, important uh, group is uh, transfusion and transplantation patients. They have also very important, very high risk for this microorganism. And we must uh, care uh, for this patient especially. Uh, and sometimes, uh, for example, uh, during the multiple sclerosis treatment, we are giving some uh, very potent immune uh, suppressive uh, medicine. And uh, this can uh, cause uh, some uh, autoimmune or uh, other type of uh, encephalitis. And uh, a large outbreak, there is also uh, a, a very um, sad situation because of uh, contaminated uh, methylprednisolone acetate injection. Uh, these patients also had meningitis uh, because of these improper uh, medications. And uh, there are also some risk uh, groups and some risk factors. Neonate, especially, uh, at risk, at risk, and uh, this uh, virus uh, are a real uh, threat for them. And infant, infant and child again uh, are risk group. And uh, elderly, not, not so elderly, actually, we, we are all more than 60 years uh, as a faculty, <laughs> so I can uh, get a little bit down. <laughs> okay, uh, people more than uh, 60 years old uh, are at risk, especially for Listeria monostogenes and uh, V Z V and H S V virus. Female also. Female at risk for uh, anti NMDR uh, autoimmune encephalitis and immune compromised patients, uh, as I said before, and some tropical uh, region. Uh, etiology uh, is important. Uh, epidemiology clues and assessment of risk factors to identify pot potential etiological agents should be sought in all patients uh, for, with encephalitis. You can get some clues uh, related to uh, travel, related to uh, animals related to uh, food uh, uh, habitation and uh, some uh, different cities or climates. And uh, clinical clues are really important. General and specific neurological findings uh, may be uh, helpful in suggesting certain causative agent uh, because a certain microorganism can cause some uh, definite some uh, similar uh, neurological uh, findings. And in patients with encephalitis and history of recent infectious illness or uh, vaccination, the diagnosis 
uh, of uh, acutisimne asfromilit should be considered. And uh, these pictures for you from my country. Uh, these are Selçukian uh, paintings. And uh, this is Ephesus, very famous. Uh, and this is Çatalhöyük, the oldest uh, settlement in the world in Konya for Saturday, present for Saturday, <laughs> for you. Yeah, epidemiologic uh, clues uh, uh, are important and you can uh, predict something from season of, of the year, geographical localization, prevalence of the disease in the local community, travel history, animal contact, insect contact, occupational exposure, recreational activities, vaccination history, immune status, and you can increase these questions. And uh, the age is important, as uh, I said, talked before, neonates uh, have possible uh, infectious agents, infant and children are different uh, microbi uh, microbial uh, tendency. And elderly person also uh, have different, and uh, you can predict these uh, microorganisms and you can ask laboratory directly for this organism. This is important to know uh, microorganism and uh, age uh, relationship. And uh, most common etiologies uh, are enterovirus and uh, unknown uh, situation, bacterial meningitis, herpes simplex, very important, non-infectious uh, conditions, fungal, arbovirus, and other viruses. Again, you see uh, Selçukian uh, wall paintings. Yes, uh, etiology, if we can uh, look at etiology of the um, etiologic uh, uh, factors for uh, encephalitis syndrome, you can see a lot of viral agents, arboviruses, flaviviruses, uh, bunyaviruses, rheoviruses, herpes viruses, enteroviruses, uh, orthomyxoviruses, paramyxoviruses, adenoviruses, and uh, parvoviruses, raptoviruses, a new uh, friend of us, coronavirus. Uh, this is uh, totally new. We have previous coronavirus, but uh, SARS-CoV-2 is more potent and more dangerous uh, for uh, neurological uh, involvement. And we have non-viral agents, rickettsia, and some bacterial agents, pyogenic tuberculosis, uh, meningitis, mycoplasma, listeria, spirochete, leptospirosis, fungi, protozoa, and uh, all these uh, can uh, etiological factors. And other causes, we have other causes, non-infectious inflammation of uh, brain, like acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, anti, uh, antibody associated encephalitis, collagen vascular disorders. This is also very important. Infectious uh, encephalopathy, and it's, these are cerebral malaria, shigella, dengue, sepsis, enteric uh, encephalopathies. We have some structural cause of coma and associated fever due to another cause. We have to make differential diagnosis. Tumor, vascular event, head injury, other space occupying lesion can mimic encephalitis. And functional causes of coma with associated fever due to another cause. These are very common actually. We live, uh, we experience every day uh, in uh, our patients actually, in, in our, especially in our intensive care. Electrolyte encephalopathy, Reyes syndrome, uh, diabetic coma, uh, uremic coma, hepatic coma, inborn error of metabolism, chemicals, toxin, and hypertensive encephalopathy. Because of these differential diagnoses, complexity, because of complexity of this differential diagnosis, the prompt diagnosis of encephalitis 
is getting delayed, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. And uh, another uh, important issue is non infectious CNS diseases, uh, vasculitis, collagen vascular disease, and paraneoplastic syndrome can have clinical presentations similar to those of infectious cause of encephalitis and should also be considered in the differential diagnosis. We actually considering this, uh, this group, but uh, the diagnosis is taking a lot of uh, time and uh, not, not short. Uh, very uh, long time actually. And these are all special laboratory uh, investigations and uh, diagnosis of encephalitis, a real encephalitis is uh, getting late again. Yeah. And uh, we have uh, encephalitis uh, conditions, uh, autoimmune, actually immune mediated encephalitis. Acute uh, encephalomyelitis, this is very important. We are uh, actually facing uh, not too rare with this condition. Uh, this is inflammatory, multifocal, dominating con condition of the central nervous system. And uh, it can present uh, different uh, in uh, children and adults. Uh, magnetic resonance imaging is very important, very useful to make diagnosis. And uh, you can see multifocal high signal lesion, uh, especially on T2 weighted and fluid attenuated inversion recovery sequences. Uh, these are also cartil sub cortical, central, and periventricular uh, white matter and deep, uh, deep gray matter uh, lesions. And uh, you have to look for anti uh, IgG. Uh, this is important. And uh, the prognosis uh, may be good or worse. Uh, according to your uh, selection of treatment. Another very important group, autoimmune uh, encephalitis group, is anti-NMDR receptor uh, encephalitis. Uh, this is also a very large group, and um, main uh, symptoms are psychiatric symptoms, seizure, memory loss, and mutism. For this reason, uh, we are consulting uh, we, actually uh, by uh, psychiatric clinics uh, for these patients. Uh, this syndrome evolves uh, to include movement disorders, dysautonomia, sometimes hyperventilation, uh, can be lethal, uh, can have very, very bad uh, outcome. Uh, but uh, the treatment also um, uh, is uh, very uh, useful. If you can recognize uh, the symptoms uh, of these patients and you can diagnose promptly, you can start uh, early uh, treatment, immune treatment, and you can save the patient's life. Yes, uh, NMDR antibodies cause relapsing symptom post uh, herpes simplex encephalitis in up to 20% of herpes simplex virus encephalitis. This is important. Sometimes autoimmune uh, NMDR antibody encephalitis and post uh, herpes simplex encephalitis can uh, can be combined or uh, can cause challenging situation uh, during the diagnosis. And uh, uh, both for both uh, relapsing symptoms can markedly improve with immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is very important selection of uh, the prompt selection of immunotherapy and early uh, treatment is very important. Uh, this is a case of ours. Uh, 
young female patients. Uh, she was a student, uh, 19 year old. Uh, she had uh, subacute psychiatric symptoms, fever, headache, and uh, we saw her at psychiatric clinic. She was very agitated. Uh, she had delusions, hallucinations, uh, personality changing, and uh, her uh, family uh, was um, uh, actually un unhelpful for this condition because uh, they stated that this is not our uh, daughter. She changed uh, dramatically. We don't know her uh, very different uh, from a previous uh, status. And uh, she had fever, uh, not too much, and blood pressure a little bit was high. And uh, at the neurological examination, uh, she was uh, uh, she was some uh, at some non situation. No meningeal sign. Uh, she had uh, hyperactive tendon reflex and Bobinski sign. And uh, her laboratory findings not so um, abnormal actually, within normal limits. And her imaging was normal, surprisingly. And cranial tomography, tomography was normal also. And uh, in number puncture, uh, just 10 white blood count and 100% lymphocyte. Culture, uh, CSF culture were, was normal. EEG was normal. We uh, started acidovir in a normal dose. And she had orobucan and focal seizure. And we, but EEG was normal. And uh, we add valproic acid uh, and monitor to her treatment, but we uh, didn't uh, have any improvement on 10th day of the treatment. And uh, uh, repeated MRI was also normal. Lum lumbar puncture uh, was repeated, uh, again, normal, uh, not so. Uh, she was uh, at uh, uh, intensive care. And uh, we decided to continue antiviral treatment until 14th day and uh, to investigate NMDA receptor ant antibodies uh, to exclude autoimmune encephalitis. By the way, uh, not to be late, we started uh, IVIG. And uh, we uh, got uh, anti NMDA receptor uh, positive, was positive. And uh, she improved dramatically uh, after IVIG treatment. And after one week, no need uh, neurointensive care. And uh, she could go to home as normal after 15 days. And she uh, came to visit, uh, to thank with her family. Uh, she was very happy and successful uh, at her school. But she was uh, lucky. Uh, every patient uh, is not so lucky. If you can look at this map, uh, this is a decision to start immunotherapy. You can see the green color means no. This means that many patients had no opportunity to, to be given uh, immunotherapy. Yeah. Another important uh, group is uh, autoimmune group, anti-voltage-gated potassium channel uh, uh, encephalitis, a little bit uh, similar. Uh, paraneoplastic limbic encephalitis, uh, this is also very important and, and very interesting group. And, uh, I know uh, Professor Grisold uh, within the faculty uh, has very important uh, publication uh, for this group. Very helpful, I recommend. And other group, increasing number of serum autoantibodies, and it's getting increasing uh, 
by the uh, passage of the years, because if you can look at different autoantibodies, uh, be it uh, uh, patient uh, uh, encephalitis, you can find maybe uh, another uh, different antibodies and you can save uh, again your patients. Uh, travel history is important because every uh, region has their own um, microorganism. So uh, you can ask uh, for the region to your patients for decide to uh, look uh, for the investigation. And animal exposure is uh, extremely important. Uh, you know, recently uh, for um, SARS-CoV-2, that uh, was very important. And there are also another uh, animal uh, and zoonotic uh, source. Recreational uh, activities important, uh, sexual transmitted uh, encephalitis, uh, fresh water, um, soil, mud, for example, occupational one. Uh, animal husbandry, uh, unvaccinated uh, measles, mumps, rubella, VZV are important. And uh, if you can uh, uh, look at pathogenesis and try to explain pathogenesis of encephalitis. Uh, invasion, we, we can see, we, we see that globally invasion by a, by a pathogen uh, causing direct neuronal injury is the most common cause of, of encephalitis. Direct injury is important, but it can be uh, acute, subacute or chronic uh, period and manifestation can occur according to this uh, duration. Uh, sometimes the inflammation is not due to invasion, but uh, is an in indirect immunologically mediated injury. Uh, these, these are uh, important. Uh, for example, during the SARS-CoV-2 um, encephalitis or infections, uh, cytokine stones, inflammatory stones are uh, very uh, important, reported, reportedly very important. Yes, and um, another mechanism is vasculitis and increase uh, in pro-inflammatory cytokine, a higher level of uh, interleukins and other um, uh, pathogenetic factors and autoimmune uh, encephalitis also. Uh, these are all immunologic with immunological uh, pat uh, pathogenesis. And there are some uh, new concepts after uh, herpes virus simplex uh, encephalitis. You can see NMDA uh, encephalitis and post uh, HSV encephalitis. And uh, we can talk about a little bit shortly uh, for COVID-19 encephalitis. There are a lot of uh, paper and it's getting increased by uh, every, every day, actually, not, not every year. But within uh, five months, we have enormous amount of uh, paper uh, for COVID-19, actually. Uh, COVID-19, uh, also important for encephalitis uh, because uh, it has a direct viral effect. Uh, it's a neurotropic virus and also hematogenous uh, way important, circumventricular way important, transneuronal pathway and ACE2 uh, extremely important because neurons has, have uh, ACE2 uh, receptors and uh, after uh, encephalitis, uh, demonization uh, can be important. There are also systemic uh, effects of uh, COVID-19. These are again inflammation, and, uh, coagulation disorders, endovascular uh, disorders, very important. And you can see uh, this uh, virus effect uh, for pathogenesis. 
And uh, the third stage, neurocovid stage third, you can see encephalitis. This is the last stage, the most important, most severe stage, actually. And these patients exhibited a diffuse petechial hemorrhage in the entire brain. And uh, both groups showed lymphocytic panencephalitis and meningitis. There is also important paper by uh, Professor uh, Gustavo Roman, and uh, this is a very hardworking group picture I'm in, and I'm proud of this. Uh, I'm proud of uh, to be in here. Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, efforts to understand uh, COVID-19. Yes, uh, investigation and diagnosis are very important uh, for the uh, encephalitis because uh, to find the specific etiologic agents uh, are very important uh, to make potential prophylaxis and treatment and uh, to uh, predict prognosis and uh, to counseling of patients and families and even to plan healthcare, national healthcare, if it is a pandemic. Clinical features uh, important, uh, geographic and seasonal factors, occupation, history of recent travel, contact with animal, animal bite, uh, to be considered and must be asked. Uh, these are uh, important clues. And uh, clinical manifestation can appear uh, as dependent on uh, uh, which brain parenchyma or uh, meninges uh, are predominantly involved, actually. Uh, so you can see a lot of uh, symptom uh, related to um, uh, region of uh, central nervous system. Typical uh, features include initial stage of fever, headache, vomiting, and uh, convulsions, coma, neurological findings, with or without sign of meningeal irritation. In uh, emergency services, uh, emer emergency physicians uh, controls for patients for meningeal irritation. If the patient had, has not any meningeal irritation, they uh, easily exclude uh, encephalitis and meningitis. Th this is, this is a very important cause of delay, delay of diagnosis and treatment. Severe cases may be associated with a life-threatening rise of intracranial tension, decerebration, or flux coma, and uh, this stage uh, typically uh, lasts for seven to 10 days. And after uh, this period, uh, recovery can begin. Uh, examination uh, must be systemic, uh, including skin. You can see the rash. Uh, this is a picture from patient, uh, parotitis, uh, mucous membrane lesions, uh, concurrent upper respiratory infections, uh, even um, pneumonia uh, diagnosis is important. And uh, you can uh, decide uh, uh, which micro, uh, microorganism must be uh, investigated according to the clinical uh, symptoms. If uh, the patient had a cerebellar ataxia, you must uh, look at uh, varicella zoster virus, Epstein Barr, mumps virus. Uh, for cranial nerve abnormalities, you must uh, again uh, have a syntax virus. So you can see uh, all these um, specific uh, microorganisms according to the specific. Uh, neurological symptoms. Yes. Uh, for example, again here, parking for Parkinsonian feature, flavia viruses are extremely important, and anti -DR2, DR2 is very important. For brainstem dysfunction, enteroviruses, flavia viruses, listeria monostogenes, very, very common. And uh, other um, uh, paraneoplastic uh, disorders must be uh, investigated. Yeah. 
this table can uh, be larger. Yeah, lumbar puncture is very important. Uh, and uh, after uh, exclude uh, contraindication, uh, you must see the lumbar puncture for differential diagnosis of many diseases. Uh, opening pressure, um, cell count, cell type, glucose level, protein level, all uh, can help to make diagnosis between among viral meningitis, encephalitis, bacterial meningitis, tuberculosis meningitis, and fungal meningitis. And uh, for this, we must uh, complete uh, neuroimaging studies before uh, lumbar puncture. And uh, these are uh, general uh, laboratory uh, studies uh, from uh, CSF and plasma. Sometimes uh, you can use, you must use CSF and plasma both. Sometimes you can select just CSF or just plasma, which, uh, which is a, uh, depends on your facility, depends on your condition. Um, these are all uh, their details. You can press it. Yeah. These are the all general evaluation for uh, microorganism, and uh, you must uh, be careful uh, to to have suboptimal specimen handling. You must enough CSF. You must enough plasma, and uh, you must store in uh, available uh, suitable condition these uh, samples uh, to have. A proper result. Antibodies again uh, very important uh, and culture. Uh, CSF culture uh, are of limited value uh, because uh, we have not too much positive result after the uh, CSF culture but sometimes especially for bacterial uh, microorganism and fungal uh, microorganism we prefer uh, to make uh, culture studies. EEG uh, can be important. Uh, if uh, you have uh, an EEG laboratory and the patient is uh, available for this investigation, uh, it's uh, extremely helpful. You can uh, see, um, tem especially temporal uh, focus, uh, periodic lateralizing epileptic form discharge are very important. And uh, you can uh, have a serial EEG and uh, you can uh, follow uh, the clinical improvement with EEG also. Yes, these are all EEG samples. Yes, imaging. The most, uh, maybe the most important way uh, to make diagnosis because there are a specific region for a specific microorganism and uh, easy to access actually. But you must uh, use contrast medium and gadolinium because uh, acute uh, brain, uh, blood brain barrier damage is uh, important during the acute stage, uh, but uh, after the uh, cranial um, neuroimaging, uh, you must look uh, for other uh, body part imaging for paraneoplastic uh, causes. These are uh, specific sites and microorganism, so uh, you can uh, give instruction uh, to the laboratory according to the uh, to these data. Yeah. These are all radiological features uh, uh, related to uh, specific uh, micro microorganism. Uh, we have some uh, samples uh, uh, of neuroimaging, herpes simplex virus encephalitis. Uh, especially uh, on the temporal region, you can see. 
and this is a, a patient of ours, a young woman. Uh, she had very severe uh, temporal involvement by uh, herpes simplex type 1. And after recovery, uh, she has a very prominent uh, atrophy at the same region. Uh, she is fine. Uh, actually, daily life is uh, uh, good, uh, normal, but... Um, uh, she has severe memory dysfunction. If uh, you ask uh, something uh, related to uh, events before several weeks or several months, uh, she doesn't um, remember, but she's extremely good in art, artwork. And uh, uh, she'll continue to her life in this way. And this is hormone immunodeficiency virus and Japanese encephalitis, very, very specific. Dengue. I haven't seen uh, this kind of patient actually. What is cellular zoster encephalitis? You can see it can be mixed uh, with um, other type demyelinating disease actually, or lymphoma, you can see. So we have to be careful. And Kruzfeld Jacob disease. These are very specific lesions. Yeah. Again, anti NMDR encephalitis. You can confuse everything. Rasmussen encephalitis. Oops, pardon. Again, stomegalovirus and parechovirus. Actually, I haven't seen this kind of patient. Again, HS after uh, post uh, herpes virus uh, one encephalitis. This is a patient of our uh, limbic. Uh, she, he had limbic encephalitis, encephalitis uh, clinic, but um, uh, also had uh, anti uh, antibodies, and unfortunately, we lost him. Brain biopsy is important, but uh, this is the last point of uh, diagnosis because extremely difficult. And uh, but uh, if you need, you must do this. Uh, if you look at the treatment, we have specific tre therapy treatment for viral agents. Uh, Acyclovir uh, is the main uh, drug in this area and 10 milligram per kilogram and administered as an intravenous infusion uh, uh, every eight hours for 14 days. And uh, generally this is uh, a successful antiviral uh, treatment, but sometimes uh, we have to give more additional uh, seven days uh, to complete uh, 21 days. Yes, these are all uh, specific treatments. Yeah. And uh, a specific treatment, uh, treatment is also very important and uh, conversions must be treated with a proper uh, anticonvulsive uh, drugs. Uh, if the patient's raised intracranial pressure, we must use uh, monitor infusion or intravenous furosemide to decrease intracranial pressure because this is life threatening uh, condition. And the gastric uh, and uh, steroid also a challenging uh, issue. Uh, some studies, some trials uh, show that uh, it can be uh, useful for prognosis, but uh, some uh, studies uh, have not uh, similar uh, results. Yes. 
And uh, there is a good uh, uh, algorithm, uh, actually guideline by French uh, colleagues. Uh, these are uh, some useful uh, recommendation and uh, evaluation. Uh, these are similar to uh, told before. And uh, there are important questions. Um, then uh, the uh, CSF examination must be done. All these uh, related to previous uh, information. Where to hospitalize the patient? This is important question because these patients actually uh, have not any special uh, special unit like stroke patients. For this reason, uh, these are uh, under care conditions. And uh, if the patient uh, has Glasgow score uh, less than 13, more than one seizure, uh, or status of the glucose require intubation or ventilate uh, or protect airways. Respiratory, if uh, the patient has a respiratory distress, distress syndrome or another organ failure or uh, uh, severe behavioral disorders must be uh, hospitalized and in a standard uh, special unit. Uh, even uh, in intensive care, this is better option. And uh, anti-infective treatment must be initiated as soon as possible, actually. If you suspect the diagnosis of uh, encephalitis, uh, viral encephalitis, uh, and um, you have a, a uh, available option, you must uh, start with uh, acidovir. And uh, if you have suspicion for bacterial meningitis, com it's combined for uh, just, uh, your, uh, bacterial meningitis, you must uh, start amoxicillin, sometimes together. And uh, according to the uh, so the uh, clinic uh, informant of patient, you can decide uh, uh, to continue antiviral tr treatment or antibacterial treatment or other immunosuppressive treatment. So you must re-evaluate uh, of the uh, treatment at uh, 48 hours. Uh, yes, you can see uh, uh, the requirement uh, during the 48 hours um, evaluation. You can have these guidelines from the uh, or this uh, presentation. Uh, surgery uh, or symptomatic treatment is important. Sometimes uh, craniectomy uh, can be needed and it can be uh, like giving, but not so common. Yes. Um, okay. So um, you have normal uh, laboratory uh, data for the patient, uh, vital signs, normal uh, partial uh, oxygen pressure. Uh, the hypotension is very uh, harmful uh, condition uh, with, for the encephalitis patients. So uh, you must check for the blood pressure. Uh, and severe anemia uh, also very challenging. And you must raise the hemoglobin. Temperature control is important. Normal glycemia and normal natrium is important. Uh, EEG uh, can uh, guide you, but uh, not uh, exclude the other uh, conditions. And uh, if you confirmed uh, with the laboratory investigation, 
so uh, you must uh, manage your patient in a different way for uh, you know competent uh, adults this is very important and you must manage uh, your patients uh, with the standard treatment uh, of uh, HSC ascolitis, uh, acetylovir, 10 milligram per uh, kilogram for uh, one hour every eight hours. This is a great A uh, recommendation also. But you must check nephrotoxicity uh, condition and you must uh, establish adequate rehydration. And um, uh, you must be very careful uh, for the uh, neurological symptom, improving or deterioration of uh, neurological symptoms. Uh, varicella zoster virus encephalitis is also very important in immunocompetent uh, adults. Uh, you need uh, to treat uh, uh, with acyclovir, but uh, the uh, dosage is a little bit higher, must be 15 milligram per kilogram for uh, one hour every eight hours. And uh, foscarnit may be uh, used for second line treatment if uh, your patient has uh, resistance to acetyl. Uh, and corticosteroid treatment is not recommended at this point. Uh, for hysteria, you must select amoxicillin. Uh, 200 milligrams per uh, kilogram per day. Uh, again, you must be careful for uh, nephrologic and hepatologic uh, functions. Tuberculosis encephalitis uh, is important in incompetent adults, and uh, they have um, uh, proper. Um, Guideline for treatment uh, is on niacin and rifampicin and presinamid uh, must be select and uh, control uh, is important. Uh, close control, close monitoring. If uh, HSV PCR is negative, should acyclovir uh, must be continued or um, discontinued? Uh, HSV encephalitis diagnosis may be uh, ruled out when the HSV PCR performed on the second lumbar puncture four days minimum after onset of neurological sign is negative. In that case, acyclovir must be continued until the result of the second PCR are available grade A. Uh, should acyclovir be continued when the varicella zoster uh, PCR is negative uh, in case of clinical suspicion? If uh, the patient has vesicular rash or cranial nerve damage uh, and, uh, or suggestive MR, <laughs> then the initial PCR is negative. Another PCR should be performed on a new sample four days after symptom onset. And aspirin should keep on being prescribed with the same dosage while waiting for the PCR result. Uh, the time is very important. Again, I'm repeating, it must not to be late. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, should a corticoid therapy be initiated when the diagnosis still needs to be confirmed at uh, 48 hours? Um, uh, actually, uh, it must be decided with a multidisciplinary meeting. Uh, it, it can be harmful or useful according to the conditions. And doxycycline treatment, uh, if uh, in the absence of clear feature indicative, one of the four most common etiology in the case of a subspectic encephalitis caused by intracellular bacteria, a trial of toxicity treatment can be discussed uh, based on yeah. suspicion. For this reason, um, uh, region, uh, geographic region is important and uh, travel history is important. Yes, uh, uh, MRI and uh, CSF uh, investigation must be continued until 
the patient condition improve. If we can uh, summarize all the management guideline uh, algorithm. Uh, uh, one, uh, encephalopathy defined by the presence of some uh, or all of the following features, altered level of conscious, altered cognition. And if, if the patient has encephalopathy, we said before, in combination with two or more of the following, uh, these are criteria for encephalitis. If yes, we must uh, continue with first line in investigations. Uh, this includes CSF, serology, respiratory viral testing, stool viral, uh, viral testing, MRI of the brain, chest X-rays, EEG, and uh, empiric, uh, if uh, these are uh, uh, these are apparent in our patient, we must consider addition of empiric antimicrobial for the steria monostogenes. Uh, with this condition, uh, we must commence empiric acyclovir uh, as the previous uh, told uh, dosage. And uh, we must arrange a specialist consultation and neurology must be the primary consultant and the infectious disease, microbiology and radiology is also important. And uh, as a second uh, step, uh, we must identify clinical features, risk factor, radiological features to guide second line investigation. Uh, we must consultate uh, with neurologist, infectious disease, radiologist, microbiologist, and uh, we must uh, consider uh, risk groups, children and neonates, immunocompromised patients, in, uh, immunosuppressive uh, patients with under uh, immunosuppressive therapy, international travelers, and um, we must consider if uh, HSV encephalitis is excluded and therefore determine duration of acyclovir therapy. Uh, in a one, in a patient without neuromedian suggest for HSV encephalitis, uh, cis empiric uh, acyclovir. If a negative CSF PCR for HSV is obtained, if the CSF was sampled between day three and seven of the clinical illness, two negative CSF PCR for HSV are obtained. The first PCR in the first two hours of clinical illness. In a patient with neuromagen suggestive of HSV encephalit, irrespective of CSF PCR results, then continue acyclovir for 21 days if uh, more uh, less than three months and uh, 14, 21 days if uh, more than. Uh, three months, child or adults, and consider CSF, HSV, immunoglobulin G testing after day 10. Uh, yes. And if, uh, and then uh, we must definitive treatment, uh, we must define a definitive treatment of etiology if identified. Uh, where the relevant reports mm -hmm. case to public health. We must sometimes we have to report this case to the health authorities uh, to uh, establish a national report or national guideline or prevention uh, strategies. If no etiology identified, consider empiric treatment of possible etiologies, including immunotherapy, corticosteroid, or IVIG based on clinical features, risk factors, radiological features in consultation with neurologist and infectious disease specialist, but mainly neurologist. And as a last step, consider third line investigations if the patient remain unwell and other investigations are negative or the patient is deteriorating and etiological diagnosis has not yet been made, then repeat CSF sampling for microscopy, CSF beta histology, repeat HSV-PCR, 
CS, uh, CSF immunoglobulin testing uh, for HSV, ZBZ, clavivirus, immunoglobulin index, and other. And other epidemiologic, if you have a specific microorganism in your region, you must look at them. Uh, repeat MRI brain. Sometimes you can have uh, new lesions uh, uh, despite the treatment or uh, in the case of uh, uh, failure of treatment or resistance to treatment. Uh, sequence string, you must include T1, T2 flares, a diffusion weighted gradient echo, but um, gadolinium contrast must be definitely exist. Uh, it is essential to lie with a neuro, neuro radiologist uh, to uh, evaluate the uh, MR imaging. All patients in this circumstance should be tested for anti-NMDR. This is extremely important. If your patients uh, doesn't respond to the treatment, please keep in mind to look uh, for anti-NMDR, anti-voltage uh, gated potassium channel, and uh, according to your region, uh, to uh, others. And brain biopsy, this is the last step, uh, actually. We don't need too much, but sometimes um, uh, it's uh, very confusing with uh, solid tumors. And uh, this is very useful uh, and sometimes a uh, life-saving uh, procedure. Yes. So we must keep in mind uh, other uh, diagnosis, differential diagnosis uh, in our minds, infective uh, causes, inflammatory causes, metabolic causes, neoplastic uh, etiology, mm -hmm. other, uh, and uh, we have to be very, very quick to make an urgent, uh, very fast uh, diagnosis and attempt to treat uh, our patients. And these are all uh, from my country, ancient sites. Yeah. And uh, key points are very important. Uh, lumbar puncture is uh, vital. Uh, imaging is very important. Asicure is the is a time critical life saving, saving treatment as thrombolytic treatment. This is very important. Time is brain for the encephalitis also. Investigation and management of suspected autoimmune encephalitis should be undertaken in consultation with a neurologist. And many patients with encephalitis will have residual physical and neurophysiological issues and require a multidisciplinary approach on their ongoing care because they have a lot of disability because of encephalitis. Uh, uh, with my best wishes uh, for uh, you, please stay safe. And uh, mm -hmm. I would like to thank my dedicated uh, team. Uh, uh, they have uh, great uh, uh, dedicated soul to our patients. And uh, we have uh, very, very challenging time as a team uh, to make decisions, uh, to be happy and sometimes set times. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for very it. much. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ostrook, uh, for a very exhaustive, in-depth coverage of this important topic of encephalitis. Thank you very much indeed. And I think before we go on to the question and answers, it's a great my pleasure to say that uh, we have very distinguished uh, people on the panel. We have Professor Raj Shakir, former president of the World Federation of Neurology, Professor Wolfgang Bissol, Secretary General. Mm -hmm. We also have Professor Senak Bandhu Sena, President of the Sri Lanka Neurological Association. And we have Dr. Augusta Chathwe, President of Pekin Association of Neurology. They are also on the board and they're all enjoying your talk. 
I think in the questions and answers, uh, we wouldn't... Uh, yeah, I just want to interrupt. Uh, so yeah, yeah, please, before please. Before we go for questions. Yeah, please. Yeah, I would like to uh, thank you, sir, for uh, chairing this session. And uh, Professor Singhal, as you know, is a director of neurology at Bombay Hospital Institute of Medical Sciences. And uh, what is important is uh, that he has been organizing uh, neurology updates since 1996. And he's a great clinician, teacher of teachers, and uh, he's blessed with talent and wisdom. Welcome you, sir. And at the age of 87, his enthusiasm and uh, energy is infectious. Professor David Garcia, uh, welcome, Professor uh, Garcia. Thank you. Uh, Garcia is, after doing his residence in neurology uh, from Madrid and fellowship in headache medicine, mm -hmm. He also did his master's in neuroinfectious diseases and then master's in clinical research and master's in headache disorders. And uh, he has done clinical or research stays in India, Honduras, Cameroon, Ghana, Denmark, New York, Boston, Ivory Coast. So this native of uh, Ekla has experience of all the continents and he's uh, chairman of international section of Spanish Society of Neurology. He's a fellow of uh, European Headache Federation, member of International Headache Society, has a lot of publications, and uh, his area of interest are uh, secondary headaches in emergency department and uh, headache uh, in COVID-19. Welcome, Professor Garcia, and I would also like to welcome uh, Dr. Senega Bandusena, who is uh, uh, president of uh, Sri Lankan Neurologist Association, and uh, Professor Oshik Sidi. He, he is director of research and cultural relations and professor of internal medicine and neurology, head department of neurosciences, Soba University Hospital, University of Khartoum, Sudan, and he has organized many neurology courses and teaching programs. So uh, welcome you all, and uh, I would also like to welcome the presenters, Dr. Sudhir Kothari, uh, Dharanjay Duberkar, and uh, uh, Professor Raj Shakir, Professor Gulfan Grisol, Agastina uh, Charve Feli, and uh, uh, Hugo Garcia, and all others. Thank you. Chairperson, please carry on. I think among the questions, we have one question from Dr. Prabhu Pasi from Indore, India. Do you think uh, COVID pandemic will result in delayed autoimmune encephalitis epidemic? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 if that happens, you know, when do you think uh, we should expect it? He wants to know the answer. Uh, may I? Please. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh... Uh, thanks again uh, for this opportunity and for your patience. And um, I'm very uh, proud of, uh, of uh, to, to be in, uh, in this group, actually. Yes, uh, I have a similar concern, actually, uh, with my colleagues. Um, this is uh, actually which the, there are some early reports uh, that um, uh, there is direct uh, neurotropic uh, effect of COVID-19 to the brain parenchyma, but also there are some uh, inflammatory effect of uh, uh, COVID-19 also. There are uh, severe uh, in, uh, inflammation signs and um, uh, hemorrhagic necrosis and uh, after this period uh, we don't know uh, if there is um, delayed uh, uh, autoimmune uh, encephalitis or um, autoimmune uh, degenerative uh, encephalopathies or degenerative disorders uh, can be, uh, we see, but um, this is uh, COVID-19 uh, 
SARS-CoV-2 virus is really very potent uh, virus for uh, cerebral uh, tissue. Thank you for your answer. Uh, as you brilliantly said, uh, we may be aware of all these possibilities. With the preceding uh, coronaviruses, like the MERS and the first SARS-CoV, we mm -hmm. see, have seen some uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome-like uh, mm -hmm. syndromes. And uh, I think that the audience is very interested in COVID-19. It's the new kid in the town, and uh, probably is the $1 million question about uh, how the COVID-19 encephalitis is. So I think that uh, given that we have uh, like four questions regarding which areas of the brain are more affected, if is there any distinctive MRI or CSF feature, and how would you treat those patients? Could you give us a short summary of uh, how to deal with COVID-19 encephalitis? Please. So I was took question uh, for you. Uh, sorry, sorry. You want to know how would you deal with yeah. the encephalitis? COVID okay, plan. okay. Uh, maybe I have to share my screen again for the COVID part. Is it possible? Sure. Okay. Yes, ma'am, you can share. Mm -hmm. There are also related questions I might really add to that. You know, when Mr. Shahzad Islam asked, how can we investigate COVID-19 encephalitis? And what are the common CSF features in COVID-19? Um, so you might combine the everything. You know, yeah, actually, we are going to have one full session on COVID-19. <laughs> yeah. Today? Yes. Today? Yeah, so we'll take uh, those questions uh, during that time. Okay. We, 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 today? Is it... No, so, later okay. on. Because now... Uh, okay. We are on a very no. exhaustive review, so I think uh, we can move okay. on to cases. Okay. Um, can, okay, so you want yeah. this, uh, Professor Ostrick, to answer this question before we move on? Yes, okay. you can answer uh, briefly, or uh, we can take, uh, because we are going to have a full session on uh, COVID 19. Okay. On COVID 19. Yeah, later on. Sure. Later okay. on in the period. Okay, okay, just briefly, I can say that yeah. uh, this virus. Uh, induces some uh, different uh, responses. Uh, these are direct response in parenchyme, systemic responses, hematologic uh, responses, and uh, related to endovascular uh, system. So, uh, the, according to my knowledge, there is not a specific region uh, for. Um, uh, COVID-19 disease, but olfactory nerve and uh, uh, and um, the uh, olfactory nerve and uh, the regions without blood-brain barrier is susceptible to the virus. Uh, but uh, we have not too many reports related to encephalitis, but uh, uh, in autopsy series, uh, there are common, very widespread uh, necrosis, hematologic uh, hemorrhages, microhemorrhages, and necrosis uh, on the brain. So there is not so specific region on the brain. And it is possible to find in CSF the uh, virus uh, PCR uh, with PCR. Uh, and um, uh, there is not a specific EEG finding according to my uh, knowledge, but uh, with the passage of time and uh, with the collection of uh, reports, uh, I think that we will hear more detailed information according to uh, COVID-19 and um, encephalitis. Okay, thank you very much. As uh, yeah. Professor Meshram um, said, uh, we will enjoy a full session on COVID-19. And uh, we have uh, some specific questions that I think that uh, we can answer them by email or by typing. Indeed, some questions, for instance, the question from Dr. Thompson from Honduras, our Catracho colleague, was already answered during the lecture. And I'm afraid that uh, 
uh, in spite of the time, we are a bit delayed and we have to move on to the next presenters. So thank you again for the big pleasure you gave us, Professor Osturk. And and thank you. It's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Osheik Saidi from Khartoum, uh, that we will present a case which is entitled A Challenging Case of CNS Infection. So, Professor Saidi. Uh, I will say, um, do you hear me clearly? Do, do you hear me clearly? Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah we can hear you. Thank, thanks very much for the organizers. Thank you so much for such a splendid opportunity for me to share this case with you. And I am very um, um, happy that the audience has, I can say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening across the globe. Uh, I will try to to the time given, which is 20 minutes, and, and I will share uh, my screen with you in a second. Basically, I will go through the case and uh, I will just highlight a few points and all it depends on the moderators and uh, for our uh, respected uh, uh, chairperson. So I'll share the screen first. Okay. I have a bit of a problem with the, with the net here. I think that Professor Osturk should uh, stop sharing her screen now. Now we can see it. Perfect. Can I see it clear? Okay. Do you see the PowerPoint now? No. No? Um, uh, screen is being shared, sir, but uh, we can't see the PowerPoint yet. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, it's got to do uh, like uh, with what you said, your internet connectivity. Yes, yeah, yeah. we can see your screen. Yes, we can see your screen now. Do you see it now? Yes. Do you see the PowerPoint? Yeah, yeah. You yes. Can, uh, we can see your screen. All right. Yeah, perfect. 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 Yeah. Um, so. Basically, uh, Sudan is uh, in the northeast part of Africa. It shares the problems of sub-Saharan Africa. And in parts of it, it's mostly desert, but there are rainforests as well. So we see the spectrum of all the tropical diseases. I hope this case will illustrate the difficulties we face also with uh, limited uh, resources. So this is a young lady who's 25 years, housewife from central Sudan, and she's usually fit and well, no previous medical history of note. And for about eight days, she has been complaining of high grade fever and increasing headache and fatigue. Anyone in that part of the world with these symptoms, immediately the doctors or the patients will diagnose themselves with malaria. But she had a bit of difficulties moving her head. She didn't put much to that, neither her doctor in the location. She was she had poor appetite and she vomited a few times. She was very sick looking with high grade fever, 39.7, tachycardic and she's dehydrated. She has very mild neck stiffness, but no focal neurological signs. The doctor gave her IV fluids, started IV quinine, as I said, for possible malaria, which is very common, given antibiotics analgesia. There is no record of how much she received. Uh, but on the fourth day, she developed coma. She became unresponsive completely, and everybody started panicking. She also noted to have neck stiffness and a positive kernel sign. They added IV ceftriaxone, one gram BD, and they asked for transfer to Silva University Hospital in Khartoum, where I work. The journey takes around six to eight hours, depending on the road. This is our hospital, Silva University Hospital. I'm sure many of the senior colleagues Raj Shakir and the rest must uh, remember this beautiful small hospital. It's a referral hospital, tertiary care, linked to the University of Khartoum. In the way to the hospital, she had two generalized tonic chronic seizures. 
and they were aborted with IV diazepam, 10 milligrams each. She became more obtended, but luckily she continued breathing spontaneously. Uh, her blood pressure was 100 over 70 and the fever continued. When she arrived at our hospital, IV ceftriaxone and the quinine were running, but she had gross bilateral papilledema, severe neck stiffness, and the kerning sign was positive. We added coamoxiclav immediately and transferred her to the intensive care unit. So patient, again, as I said, are responsive, but we did not do a lumbar puncture. Probably this is just a nice reminder of some of the audience, I'm sure, senior audience in our unit. NG tube, urinary catheter were put in to monitor heart fluid input and output. I will leave the lumbar puncture not being done for discussion. She was loaded with one gram of IV phenytoinama. She was put on a regular dose of 300 milligrams IV once per day. The fever continued. She developed more focal fits, which I'll show you in a video. And in three days time, she started to move her left side only. A CT scan was done on arrival. It was unremarkable, surprisingly. Over 10 days on the antibiotics, she improved and she was still mildly confused. She became febrile. Everybody was happy, no meningism, and G-tube and urinary catheter removed. And we transferred her to the medical ward in preparation for discharge. Unfortunately, the focal jerks increased. And here is the video. Is the video clear? Is the video showing clearly? I don't see the video. Video is not running actually. It's not, I'll write from a file. This is a okay. I'll, I'll try to run it from the file. I expected this was a technology I'm dealing with today. So. I'll come out of this. I will run the video from, from the file. Is that okay? Yes. Uh, so another thing, uh, okay, for, let's see how the video plays. Okay. The video will run in a minute. I tested it and it was working fine, but as I said, my net connection seems to be a bit dodgy here. So um, basically, the patient is in the ward. Her eyes are turning to the left side and she has focal gears on the right side, mainly in her toes, which you will see in a minute. She has severe neck stiffness. Okay. So you will you will see the video, but I'll just keep commenting to make it time. So basically focal CS on the right side. Eyes turning to the left. Do you see the video now? Uh, yes, sir, we see it, but uh, it is not uh, playing in a flow, in a smooth flow. It's yeah, yeah. Give, give it some time. No. I do apologize for this poor net connection. Do you see the shaking of the toes on the right side? Okay, we'll go back to the presentation. Uh, so can I request you something? Uh, is, are there more videos which you want to play? No, I, I will not play more videos. I think, I think that the connection is not, is not uh, enough, but okay. I will just show photos. I'll just show sure. photos. 
Okay, okay. I'm sorry for that. Okay, so on day 11, she developed severe headache and she became more confused again after we have been so happy that she's doing well in 10 days time, she will go back to her village. She became confused and she became weak on the right side with a power of three over five. Papilledema was gross on both sides. And then we noted something which I call new sign. This is, these are the veins on the left side of her forehead. The, there was no proptosis, but these veins became so prominent on the left side of her forehead down to the vertex. This is something which I have seen like four times before. Something clicked in my mind. We have limited resources and we did a CT scan. Do you see that picture clearly? Is the picture clear? Yes, I think uh, maybe Dr. Kothari or Dr. Mishram should be able to answer that. Yeah, yes. yeah, the picture is clear. Okay, so it shows four important findings. There are areas of hemorrhages around the superior sagittal sinus. And within the sinus, this is non-contrast. She has gross papilledema, and there is some air in the left frontal area here. You can see air, so bleeding mass effect, slight deviation of the midline to the right. From our previous experience, seeing these veins becoming very prominent, we immediately thought of Duracell thrombosis, complicating what she came in with. And we added heparin. We were thinking of infectious causes, certainly. Non-infectious causes were kept in mind, but honestly, not as clear as something to think of autoimmune or metastasis because short duration fever and it was summer. So in three days an MRI scan was then showed mild hydrocephalus, but there were some web-like threads within the lateral ventricles and there was clot in the superior sagittal sinus. So heparin was started and we loaded her with warfarin as well. She improved progressively and the antibiotics were also continued. She regained full consciousness, but she was deaf on the right side and she had mild right hemiparesis, mostly noted in the lower limbs, three over five. Rest of the clinical examination was unremarkable. And her INR was maintained within two to three. Phenetone level were okay, but we changed her over being a young lady to lamotrigine. 100 milligrams per day, she had no further seizures. And in four weeks time, she was start home. She was seen in the clinic three months later, she was perfectly fine, but still deaf on the right side and had very mild right hemiparesis, four plus over five. So what people think of this case, we could not do lumbar puncture. We don't have much facilities to do a lot of sophisticated tests, but we used our clinical experience and acumen to try to manage her and she had a very good outcome. I thought that was a good lesson for all those who work in difficult situations and where there were no much facilities about how to approach things. And I don't know, shall I just explain why we didn't do lumbar puncture or I would like other people to leave that for discussion. There is a... Uh... Thank you for your case. Um, there is also indeed uh, some questions about the fact that you did not the papilledema, the lumbar puncture that were related with the uh, papilledema. Uh, All right. why, why do you think that there was uh, such a prominent papilledema if the initial cranial imaging was normal? This is the thing which we don't know. Is this papilledema is just part of no communicating hydrocephalus in the beginning. Is it the dura sinus thrombosis was brewing and we did not pick it because we didn't give contrast initially and we didn't have facility to do MRV gram immediately. Because in our hospital, we can do MR MRV. She has to go to another hospital. She was very sick. So okay. comatose okay. patient, gross papilledema, focal signs. This is why we didn't do a lumbar puncture. She had focal signs. She already started on antibiotics in the rural hospital. 
and our expectation with the microbiology facilities we have, I don't, ex I did not expect that we will grow any organism. But we know in Sudan during summer also we get a lot of meningitis, particularly meningococcal meningitis, um, type A. So we managed her in that direction. And being a young female also, we covered her for listeria. So we added comoxiclav on her. Luckily enough, the antibiotics did work, but she developed complications. She we, was... have, uh, we have many, many questions that perhaps you can answer um, by directly later because we are a bit delayed. But uh, there is one final question regarding the, the pneumoncephalon. How do you explain the presence of her in the frontal convexity? We, 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 th we thought she developed an abscess. We thought she developed, she was starting to develop, develop a, a complicating abscess. And we didn't do lumbar puncture. If we do lumbar puncture, we could say this is due to air going through the lumbar puncture. Most likely this is due to the, to the bug itself, which till now we don't know what, which, which, what was the bug exactly. Okay. We thought it was a growing abscess. Thank you very much. Uh, um, thank you so much, but I would like people to, to ask themselves three questions. Was there any role for steroids in this case? Was phenytoin the best for this young female? What about Nuwax rather than warfarin, the new novel uh, oral anticoagulants rather than using warfarin in a young female? And thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I will look forward for more participation in this novel program. Thank you so much for, for this. Thanks, thanks for the audience. Thanks to you for your brilliant, brilliant presentation. Uh, as I said, uh, perhaps you can answer some of the questions directly on the chat. And uh, so the participants will get the direct answer. And uh, in order to avoid more delay, I would I am pleased to introduce Professor Dana Jai Duberkar that will present the case. It, it was expected to be the third case, but uh, we changed the program. So he will present uh, an unusual cause of cerebellar ataxia. So please, Professor Duberkar. Yeah, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. And I'm really thankful for giving me this opportunity. Can you see all my screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So today it's Independence Day here for all the Indians. So I'm presenting it very proudly on my Independence Day. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. So we have a 67 year old male who presented with progressive imbalance while walking for last one year, which was more prominent when he used to walk through narrow passages. He did notice that there was mild incoordination in upper limbs while buttoning and unbuttoning and in lower limbs while wearing sleepers. There was incoordination. There was no history of difficulty in speaking, which he noticed. There was no history of abnormal head movements or tremulousness noticed by the patient. There was no history of weakness, sensory loss or any boil bladder involvement. There was no history of fever, headaches, drugs or Ayurvedic, which are conventional Indian medicines or any history of chronic diarrhea. There was no history of chronic cough with hemoptysis, altered bowel habits, weight loss, or any systemic features. There was no significant family, uh, no significant past history of diabetes, hypertension, ISD, or any stroke in the past. He was never admitted for any major illness in the past. He did not give any history of any genital ulceration. There was no family history of similar illness. Personal history, he was a non-addict. In the treatment history, over the past one year, he has received multiple multivitamin injections in the past with no any significant improvement. On examination, there were no neurocutaneous markers, no skull or any spinal deformity, no lymphadenopathy or any positive finding on general examination. On neurological examination, his higher mental functions were completely normal. He had mild scanning dysarthria, eye movements and were all normal. Motor system examination was normal, even sensory system was normal. In cerebellar examination, he had mild incoordination in upper and lower limbs, and there was significant gait ataxia which was present. So, with this kind of presentation, we decided to approach this case, case as a chronic progressive cerebellar ataxia with prominent gait ataxia as a prominent feature. With history of one year 
we really thought that it is likely to be a sporadic case of degenerative ataxia but in neurology there is a dictum that we want to rule out a treatable cause and we thought that if there is no treatable cause we will go ahead with the genetic studies if required this is the table from harrison's which has helped in n number of times in a given situation so the causes of chronic cerebellar ataxia with paraneoplastic syndrome in our patient there was no hist suggesty of any malignancy though symptoms of neoplasm may not be there for 2 to 5 years in a patient of paraneoplastic syndrome anti gliadin antibody syndrome he did not have any hist of diarrhea or suggesty of any chronic malnutrition hypothyroidism there was no feature then there are inherited diseases which we thought was likely cause in this patient then tertiary syphilis tevis dor Cerebellaris has been described to have cerebellar ataxia, phenytoin, and amiodarone. These are the drugs. If the patient is taking chronically, then patient can have chronic progressive cerebellar ataxia. But in this patient, there was no such history. So we thought that we will rule out treatable causes, and if required, we'll do genetic studies. So routine investigation were all normal. ESR was 35 millimeter at the end of one hour. Renal function test and liver function test were normal. His thyroid function test were normal. Vitamin B12 levels were normal. HIV was negative. MRI brain showed mild cerebral atrophy. I do not have the films right now with me, but when you expect the things, it it, it actually when you don't expect things to happen, then they happen. His serum VDRL test positive, and at this point we asked him history. So he did history. Though there was no history of genital ulceration, he said that he had a history of unprotected sex with commercial sex workers. So at this point. Our tube lights just lit up, and then we uh, walked up in the case uh, in the direction of syphilis for this patient. His serum TPHA was sent, which was positive in very high titers. CSF showed lymphocytic leukocytosis with 12 cells, and proteins were marginally elevated, 59 milligram per deciliter. And his CSM, CSF VDRL and TPHA were both reactive. So this was a case of neurosyphilis presenting with isolated cerebellar features. This patient was given crystalline penicillin at a dose of 24 million units per day for 14 days. He received it at district hospital because in India, at private hospital, it usually is it is not available. It is only available in government setups. So there, after intramuscular benzathion penicillin was given uh, 2.4 million units once a week for three weeks. At six months follow, patient showed a significant recovery in gait and limb ataxia. Patient was able to perform major activities of daily living independently. With mild residual gait ataxia was there. So before going to the review of literature, we will have a sort of quiz here. So I will show. So this is the first. We are. Uh, you can vote actually here. So this is the MRI. First is the T1 images. We have contrast images uh, in the second. Third we have the T2. Then we have flare images and we have diffusion images. So. What is the diagnosis in this patient? Is a case of syphilis basically. What is it? It is G whether it is GPI, whether you think it's meningovascular syphilis, whether it is pachymeningitis or none of the above. What it is? You can vote now. Okay, 55% people are meaning vascular syphilis, and 25% people are saying it is pachymeningitis. Actually, it is pachymeningitis because in meningovascular syphilis, what you see there will be infarcts which will be there, especially in the left MCA territory. If it was only mening meningeal involvement, then yes, meningeal syphilis. But we ask meningovascular. So here in the figure two contrast enhanced images, we can see there is typical this pachymeningitis which is there. Sorry, the sorry slide show is not moving. Uh, just click on the slide, uh, Doctor Dubeerkar. Click on the screen, and you will be able to move ahead. So this is the second patient. Here, we we have seen this is again a case case of syphilis basically. What we want you to look at these images where the white arrows are there. This is titubated images. These are 
again titubated attenuated images below are the contrast images these are contrast images and this is t2 axial images so sorry i'll just start so what is it basically what is Fine. the term used for this classical mri finding in neurosyphilis whether it is a thatched wall appearance whether it is a candle gutter appearance whether it is a bull's eye appearance or is it a trident sign what it is you can start voting now yes you are right again this is a typical candle gutter appearance which is seen with the what we can say myelitic form of neurosyphilis i will show you again these pictures when i will discuss a review of literature okay so to review the literature for the uh, no sorry there is a third question i'll go to the third question this is just yeah so all are true regarding neurosyphilis except co infection with hiv accelerates the development of meningo vascular complications of syphilis often with early stroke prozone effect is higher in hiv positive patients csf vdrl is not very sensitive tryponema specific tests in csf are quite sensitive but not specific for neurosyphilis and we can rely on csa pleocytosis to diagnose neurosyphilis you can start voting now so all are true except it's all are true except yeah so 58% said that we can rely on csa pleocytosis diagnosis syphilis neurosyphilis and that is the correct answer in zero positive that means hiv positive patient we cannot rely on only on csa pleocytosis because the pleocytosis may be absent in this patient so congratulations all for sorry so now coming to the review of literature we all know that following initial infection by tryponema pallidum partial immunity develops in the human host which is insufficient to eradicate the organism but leads to latent cardiovascular and neurological infection traditionally the neurosyphilis includes meningeal and meningovascular forms general paralysis of insane and tabes dorsalis that is syphilitic myelopathy latency from primary infection ranges up to 10 to 20 years in meningovascular syphilis 5 to 20 years for generalized paralysis of vincent and 8 to 30 years for tabes dorsalis patients with acute meningeal syphilis typically present with signs of meningitis generalized paralysis of vincent causes psychosis frontal lobe and memory dysfunction they present like dementia vascular involvement leads to large vessel ischemic strokes particularly involving the middle cerebral artery and multiple infarcts may eventually lead to vascular cognitive impairment our patient had a pure cerebellar syndrome so we just reviewed the literature what literature says about this cerebellar involvement there are 
case reports of cellular involvement there was one case report where along with cellular involvement there was myoclonus uh, executive dysfunction and their mri brain and csf uh, mri brain was normal but typical csf abnormality was there in another case there was cerebellar signs along with spastic quadriparesis was there the case by gerg et al which is very identical to our patient they had a clinical radiological they had all the similar things except that radiologically that patient had temporal lobe changes on mri was an additional finding in that meningovascular syphilis and tevis dorsalis can produce ataxia due to degeneration of posterior columns and spinal cerebellar pathways in the spinal cord so these both mechanism can lead to cerebellar ataxia in these patients so sensory ataxia as well as cerebral ataxia is common so this is the case where neurosyphilis presented with pure cerebral ataxia which was very identical except as i said that uh, mri had shown temporal lobe involvement in their patient so diagnosis of neurosyphilis is based on presence of appropriate clinical syndrome in combination with positive syphilis serology that is csf abnormality csf cells more than 5 and elevated protein more than 45 mg per deciliter and reactive csf vdrl csf vdrl is highly specific but little insensitive so if in a given situation if you think that csf vdrl is negative you can do csf tpha most of the time csf vdrl is not available in that situation even csf tpha can be done treatment requires 3 to 4 mln of intravenous aqueous crystalline penicillin for 4 hourly for around 2 weeks in those patient where we cannot give crystalline penicillin or if it is not available ceftriaxone 2 g can be given for 2 weeks retreatment is indicated if csf count has not diminished after 6 months or csf cell count and protein have not normalized after 2 years so this is a small case series we are about to we have written it up it's about to be presented this is the case where this this patient presented is a 55 year old gentleman who presented with the all signs meningeal signs that means headache he had bilateral uh, sensory neural deafness and bilateral lateral lectus palsy and we are we can see on the contrast images the pachy meningitis which was typically seen in this patient this is the another patient he is a 40 year old gentleman who presented with myelopathic form with paresthesias in lower limb he had bilateral plantar extensors so here we can see typically this is the the candle gutter appearance of the lesions where we can see on the contrast images typically these are called as candle gutter appearance uh, changes in the myelopathic form of syphilis so the learning points from this case was for us was neurosyphilis may present rarely in the form of isolated cellular involvement mri findings in neurosyphilis may have a wide variation findings include in subtle cerebellar atrophy also differential diagnosis of neurosyphilis should hence be kept in mind uh, in mind in patients with cerebellar ataxia since it is an easily diagnosed and treatable condition thank you very much you can have questions and discussion on that thank you very much thank you very much professor dubarkar for your interesting case and your uh, entertaining presentation we really enjoyed all the questions that you asked to us indeed you anticipated one of the questions that the audience had for you because uh, some of the participants was uh, questioning why did you label the case as a cervical or ataxia and not as a dorsal column uh, myelopathy but you already answered that so sensory examination yeah and uh, i think that uh, as we are a bit late we will move to the last last presentation and uh, at the very end of the session we will take all the remaining questions so thank you again professor dubercar and now we will move to the second lecture that will be our last uh, case uh, originally uh, that will be done by professor sudhir kotari from pune so please professor the the floor is yours my uh, presentation is downloading i just have a minute more so till then you can maybe uh, dr danny can uh, answer the question of course question. i'm just so opening we have, it uh, we have one more minute professor are you still over there dr dubercar okay so. uh, okay i have uh, it's opened i think let's start let's start sorry okay. let's move
Thank you, uh, Dr. Azorin. Thank you for uh, the excellent session till now. And uh, this was a great series of um, talk on the encephalitis as well as now uh, syphilis. So I'm going to show a relatively simple case. Uh, this is a young girl. She was a 26 year old female. She has been insulin dependent diabetes for the last 13 years. And uh, for the last two years, she was getting recurrent skin lesions, oral ulcers, and some vaginitis. And a skin biopsy was done which showed query cutaneous vasculitis. So oh. the dermatologist was treating her with oral prednisolone and azathioprine for the last three months. Now she came to uh, the physician and that, that's when she was referred to me. Last two months she had been getting headaches off and on. Initially the headache was settling down with uh, simple analgesics. But for the last 10 days the headache was persistent. And now one week she started getting pain in the left eye and she could not tolerate light in that left eye. Um, the ophthalmologist checked her up for uveitis and did not find any evidence of uveitis, but she could not tolerate light and it was paining. And now two days she started getting pain <clears throat> in the left side of the <coughs> face. She had double vision with a lateral rectus palsy and there was numbness over the cheek and the left uh, 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 supraorbital region. So in the V1, V2 region. Uh, this was her MRI. Uh, clinically, she had no, uh, she had a left six, I told you. She had sensory loss and the corneal was absent. I am going straight to the MRI because we are running short of time. So I have uh, sunk in the case. So now this was an MRI and I'm going to ask you some question. Uh, I would like you to go to uh, Slido and uh, let me just uh, tell you which... Uh, So you have to, uh, so you have to join Slido, go to www.slido.com on your browser, or if you have downloaded the Slido program, then enter R487. So R487, I'll give you half a minute more to join and then we'll start the quiz. Okay, I see people joining. If you haven't downloaded the app, then just go to www.slido.com and enter R487. Okay, I think we'll start, though there are uh, just about 20 people as of now, but they are joining. So let's begin. Uh, I am asking the first question. So what do you think she has got? Is it Bechet's with cranial neuropathy? Do you think it's Wegener's granulomatosis? Do you think it's a skull-based osteomyelitis? Is it malignancy or something else? Okay, so 32% think it's Bechet's, 32% think it's Wegener's, and a few think it's skull-based. Some are saying other, but what other, I don't know. Okay, the answer is actually she had a skull-based osteomyelitis seen on the MRI and you can also see something else on the MRI. Um, one minute, let me now go back to the presentation. So what you see on the MRI is she is diabetes uncontrolled, she's on steroids, she's got headache, she's got this sinus involvement sphenoid sinus and you can see the ethmoid sinus is also involved and she's got an ophthalmoplegia. So now when I put it this way, what would you think of? Um, I'm not going to ask the question, what would you think of? Just people, you can just write in the chat because it's very simple. If you have a diabetic with ophthalmoplegia and headache and sinus disease, obviously you're going to think of mucormycosis but she's got this history going on for two months and there was this confusing thing about the 
vaginitis and the skin lesions and everything. that's why we got carried away towards even i initially thought it was bechet's and i asked the ophthalmologist look for uh, uveitis etc but then uh, once we found that there was nothing else and we found the sinus it was mucormycosis so we looked carefully at the brain mri and what she had is evidence of central skull base osteomyelitis now this is a very important sign on the uh, mri the clivus normally should be white because of the fat in the marrow and it should be white but if you see here the lower part of the clivus ha has shows a t1 hypointensity so you are not seeing the fat is replaced and that is a very important sign of central skull base osteomyelitis so she had central skull base osteomyelitis seen in the clivus and when we gave contrast we found there was a lot of contrast enhancement of the soft tissues in and around the clivus so she had uh, sphenoid sinusitis becoming central skull base osteomyelitis and therefore always look at the clivus carefully so uh, now i will just go back to the question okay so we got this what is the role of surgery in the management of mucormycosis should be you be early and aggressive approach should you be early but try conservative surgery to begin with should you try antifungals for one week or at least two weeks trial of antifungals should be given and if that fails then you go for surgery excellent so the correct answer is early and aggressive approach to surgery you have to operate and remove as much of the uh, mucormycosis affected tissue as possible so surgery has to be early it has to be aggressive if necessary sometimes we've had uh, to do orbital excentration remove the eyeball or do whatever it takes to remove if no fungus should remain behind so what happened in her case i will tell you but uh, you need to go for aggressive surgery early so what is the evidence based first line therapy in mucor liposomal amphotericin b only liposomal amphotericin plus posaconazole or liposomal amphotericin b plus voriconazole i'm not giving you much time here okay the evidence actually is only amphotericin b but people do combine it with posaconazole or voriconazole or if you don't tolerate it then you go for uh, posaconazole voriconazole does not really help much in uh, mucormycosis it helps in uh, the other fungus i forget the name now but it doesn't help in mucormycosis okay how do you use liposomal amphotericin b do you give 5 mg per kg right from day 1 do you give 10 mg per kg from day 1 or do you give 2 mg per kg on day 1 and build up over the next week to 10 mg okay good but the answer is 10 mg per kg from day 1 when you have cns involvement you have to go for 10 mg per kg from day 1 we are used to the earlier non liposomal amphotericin where we used to start with a small dose and gradually build up to tolerance but once you have liposomal you give the full dose right from day one do not uh, try to build up slowly okay now we'll go back and just see what happened to our patient so she was and she underwent the caldwell lux surgery and amphotericin b was given initially 50 mg per day uh, at that time we didn't have the liposomal one and uh, this was this case was many years back almost 15 20 years ago and uh, she worsened she got total left ophthalmoplegia though her vision was spared she started getting an early left palatal ulcer and then we went for aggressive surgery skull base was debrided sphenoidectomy was done amphotericin b was continued she required for 2 months 5 grams then she finally stabilized and the pain reduced with no neuro deficit so uh, the important thing is you have to treat for a very long time we'll come to that later uh, the mri in central skull base osteomyelitis is very important you see either enhancement of the clivus or soft tissue around that or you see a hypodensity in the uh, part of the clivus and you may see the uh, parapharyngeal fat planes uh, and the soft tissues getting effaced how long do you treat 
the guideline is you treat until there is permanent reversal of the immunosuppression. So if the person has diabetic ketoacidosis, the ketoacidosis has to be controlled. If he's on steroid or something, then that has to be reduced or whatever. So the whatever the condition underlying has to be reversed and there should be complete response on imaging. Now, it's very easy to say complete response of on imaging, but when somebody has undergone surgery, he's got a lot of bony destruction, the MRI cannot really sometimes tell you is it completely responded? So sometimes you have to take a very personal decision. You think, okay, I think now it is under control. Stop it. And then it might come up again. So you, it is, uh, it is always a little wishy-washy. Uh, you have to give you IV therapy until stable disease achieved. And then later give oral osaconazole or isavuconazole. Uh, that is given as maintenance for probably a few months sometimes. Okay. So central skull base osteomyelitis, it's uncommon, but potentially life-threatening. And it arises from the sphenoid. So here it's mainly on the clivus. We'll see the other type of skull base osteomyelitis. Often these patients, like in my that girl, may have only headache initially until it spreads out and goes into the cranial nerves. The ESR may be high, and you can use that for monitoring. So the causes can be anything like mucor here, but it can be other bacteria, not necessarily pseudomonas. Okay, now we'll come to another case very briefly. Elderly diabetic with six-month history. This is again very simple case. Six month history of pain in the right ear, discharge from the right ear, facial nerve palsy, and the ENT surgeon operated him for uh, otitis externa, but three times. He was not improved. He was given augmentin, second generation cephalosporin, but the pain continued. Later, he came to me because he started getting double vision, dysarthria, dysphagia with nasal rigor, cough, and aspiration when trying to swallow. So, on examination, he was ill. He had fever and cough. Uh, he had severe dysarthria. He had a right six. We'll see his cranial nerves. He had a right six. You can see here. He had a right third partial. There's no tosis. He had a right seven. The tongue was affected. Palate was also affected. I don't have the palate. The right palate and the right tongue. He could not protrude his tongue. And his MRI showed a lot of soft tissue here near the temporal and the skull base. So he had there was a lot of bony destruction also, as you can see here on the CT scan, you can see a lot of bone destruction. Many times these people may be mistaken to have malignancy. And that's why sometimes the name malignant otite is external. So it's not malignancy, though it is going on for months. And it is due to what we call malignant otitis externa. So this patient also has that clivus affected. You can see the clivus is uh, um, no longer uh, showing the hyper intensity on T1. And uh, he was, he had to be given uh, antibiotics. So this is what it is. It's called malignant or necrotizing external otitis. It's an invasive infection of the external auditory canal and it's a osteomyelitis. Typically elderly diabetics, but also happens in other immunocompromised people. And then it can spread medially as we shall see here. It, it spreads from this cartilage, this point here where the cartilage and the bony area of the uh, or auditory canal meets and from here it goes in it will affect the facial nerve it will go further in and affect the glossopharyngeal and the other nerves as it spreads inwards so this figure shows how it spreads medially and from just uh, osteomyelitis uh, from just pain in the ear gradually it will start affecting the various cranial nerves uh, the diagnosis the other blood tests are usually okay but esr and crp can be often high and can be used to monitor disease activity and therapy. So again, we'll have a few questions. Okay, so yeah, what I is... Can, uh, in, for want of time, you can just summarize yeah. on... Okay, so it's almost finished now. Uh, what is suggestive of otitis external as against otitis media? Tenderness on pressing the triggers, there are multiple questions. Pain on pulling the pinna, tenderness on the mastoid, tenderness in temporal region, pain on chewing, and intact eardrum. So I will go ahead. The answer is all these. As against otitis media, which will have a perforated drum here, the eardrum is intact. You may get pain on chewing, but an important sign is when you press on the person's triggers on the eardrum or you pull his ear, he gets pain. Somebody with otitis media does not get pain when you pull the pinna. This is otitis externa. So the inner, the pinna is pay, uh, pains. How common is pseudomonas a cause of malignant otitis externa? Again, I think everybody knows over 90%. 98% of them have pseudomonas. 
and most of them respond to so dr shreya kamal shafi and uh, dr rk and dr gupta congratulations okay so i'm finishing the quiz just the last uh, thing sorry so uh, you have to remember this that otitis uh, malignant otitis external no, sorry why is this not going okay so important thing is uh, before i finish is the i'll just go to the last thing i had quite a few things now there are number of uh, now types of uh, skull base osteomyelitis but now we'll not go into that but important thing is skull base osteomyelitis is a treatable but life threatening disorder you must remember malignant otitis externa when there is severe ear pain in diabetics it needs early diagnosis and aggressive therapy before it goes medially and starts affecting the skull base and becomes into a skull base osteomyelitis and remember mucormycosis in any painful ophthalmoplegia in diabetics or immunosuppressed people and mucor needs aggressive and prolonged therapy thank you thank you very much dr kotari for your interesting and uh, interactive lecture you did a great discussion by yourself so we we do not have any specific questions from the audience i i had prepared the question regarding the palatal ulcer but you already mentioned that uh, in the first case that uh, it appeared early in the course of the disease my only question regarding the both cases how important is the glycemic control for the prognosis of both both conditions it's very important uh, it is very important to control the sugar as well as the acidosis it is the acidosis which is also important and so it typically happens in diabetic ketoacidosis so sometimes you have seen mucormycosis without diabetes in somebody who gets acidosis due to say renal failure or something else so the sugar is also important and the acidosis is also important it has to be controlled okay thank you well we have uh, had a, an excellent overview of this uh, afternoon of uh, cephalitis one of the great mimickers of neurology now we have uh, two of the most serious and aggressive uh, conditions that the neurologist may face. I wonder if uh, doctors Rad Sakir, Dr. Grishol, or Professor Bandusena have any have any question or comment regarding all the cases. I Thank you. Uh, I've just Wolfgang Griesold speaking from Vienna, Austria. I'm fascinated by by all talks, but just being an expert in neuro oncology, I just want to add to the baroneoplastic syndromes that we are now kind of facing a a new wave of complications, which are the ICIs, the immune checkpoint inhibitors. And also the CAR T cell therapies can also produce encephalitis and like syndromes and the targeted therapies. Uh, as far as we know, the evidence is small and the series that have been autopsied and are available are not very big. And the, the second point, a very simple point, which I, which I stumbled about was sometimes uh, in oncologic patients, also Wernicke's encephalopathy can appear like in intestinal tumors or in some chemotherapies which deprive them of vitamin B and they can resemble encephalitis. I mean, they are in encephalitis, but I just want to make you aware of that as a diagnostic pitfall. But other, thank you very much. This was just my addition as you brought to the paraneoplastic syndromes. Thank you. I would like to actually thank uh especially Dr. Chandrasekhar for inviting me from Sri Lanka to actually be a panelist here. And uh, congratulations to all four speakers. I think they were all wonderful. It was very difficult to cover encephalitis in an hour. It's a very broad area with so many differential diagnoses and uh, uh, Professor Ostrup gave an excellent uh, review, I think. Uh, all in all, I mean, it, it's a very difficult one. You did a wonderful job given the time restraints. Uh, one of the things that we have noticed here in Sri Lanka is the change in patterns of encephalitis. Uh, when I was a trainee, we had uh, quite a few Japanese encephalitis around. And then uh, now, actually, we hardly see it because of the vaccination. Likewise, uh, measles, mumps, rubella-related encephalitis is on the way down. Uh, we are seeing a little bit more dengue encephalitis now. 
Varisela is also been seen. So I think uh, sometimes uh, patterns have also been evolving. And I think with Corona, we will see some other changes as well as time goes by. And also regarding the three presentations, I think they were excellent. I think uh, all with the take home messages, especially uh, the one from Sudan, I think uh, always when there is a, a clear scan, I mean, CT, sometimes uh, you may miss uh, cerebral venous thrombosis and uh, it highlighted a very important feature when you have papilledema. And if you don't see anything, sometimes you might see a hyperdense, some, uh, you know, like uh, in the Delta sign, but then again, you can overlook and I think the outcomes are made even with, with limited resources, making the diagnosis and being aware of it uh, made a good outcome. And likewise, I think the syphilis one, I think it's very important because it's uh, nowadays we talk a lot about the uh, NMO and MOG and all those things. And it's very easy to kind of overlook, you know, in a patient like that, unless you really think about it, you really miss it. And if you miss it, you will just give steroids and it will make things worse. So that was another important uh, one. And I think uh, rhinocerebral mucomycin uh, otitis externa, I think everyone knows how important it is, but unfortunately, I think uh, very often in my limited experience, I think uh, they don't. Uh, do that well. I think uh, I think it was a different case here. Yeah, I think because you intervened very early, pretty aggressively. I think that is your experience, and I'm very happy to know that you know, like you highlighted all the important points that are really, really needed to manage these patients. Thank you so much for inviting me, and it's been a great pleasure, great honor. Thank you very much. Thanks to you. I think that uh, as most of the attendees of the uh, session. We all enjoyed the discussions and all the cases. It was uh, such a great uh, pleasure to to be with you this afternoon and uh, to be part of this uh, educational initiative. And I think that uh, despite of all the disruption that the COVID-19 has caused in all our lives, we have to still be in, feel the patient of neurology because uh, we have the most interesting specialty of uh, all medicine. I hope that you all are uh, neurologists, otherwise I will be getting in trouble. But I don't know if uh, some of other the panelists want to say uh, uh, closing remarks. Dr. Chagwefeli, Tina, or uh, any other professor? Raj Shakir was there. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, even uh, Hadi Manji was there. I don't know where they are. No, I could see them <clears throat> voting for their name. Okay. I think they've left. Okay. I think, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Serifnur. It was an excellent talk. And uh, Professor David uh, Garcia Azorin for chairing the session wonderfully. And Professor B. S. Single. And uh, uh, Dr. Seneca Bandhu Sena, uh, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, Dr. Uh, um, Ozek uh, Saidi, I think he had been traveling from Sudan to UK and finally we could uh, connect him and uh, he made an excellent presentation and thank you Sudhir and Dhananjay. And uh, um, it was great to see uh, again uh, Professor Raj Shakir and uh, Professor uh, Wolfgang Grisold and uh, uh, Professor Agustina uh, here with us and uh, we meet uh, for the next session on 22nd and on 22nd the same time 22nd August we have a talk on uh, cryptococcus by Professor Jeremy Day from Vietnam and uh, that session will be chaired by uh, Professor Steve Lays and uh, Dr. Kiran Thakur from USA and we'll have interesting cases. So looking at the interest and uh, the enthusiasm, we have decided to have series two from 26th of uh, September. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. And uh, uh, For those who, are, who know, tomorrow we have uh, neuroradiology uh, in the morning, 11 to 12, and then we have another two talks also. So all of you all are also welcome. The same password and link will work for that also. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. You took out time and uh, uh, joined with us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. You have enjoyed. It was a pleasure. Yeah. And uh, we'll uh, continue to be associated with this uh, activity. And uh, I think uh, we are going to work out further with uh, Dr. David Garcia about uh, future programs and with you. 
so that uh, we keep moving Thank and uh, thanks for the opportunity thanks for okay. everybody Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you for thank being us. Bye bye. Take care. I just arrived bye -bye. with barriers from Saudi to UK, and uh, luckily enough, I could cash with this very fantastic yeah. meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Space and space we look forward to uh, being with us uh, in future programs. And, okay, uh, thanks very much. I think I'll, I'll probably I motivate uh, others to be. Uh, for presenting cases and uh, discussion. Thank okay. you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.